grace, mercy, and peace to you from, from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, today our message, our broader message is about leadership in the church. Uh, but the tougher question, as we've been tackling tough topics, is what role do women have in leadership? Uh, and the, the LCMS position, ultimately I think is a good position, is that women can play a variety of roles in church, but they cannot be pastor or spiritual leader of the church. And today we're trying to answer why do we hold on to this position and, and what good can possibly come of it? And I think the first thing to start with is this, is even if we're wrong on this issue, I don't think we are, but even if we are, let's be sure that we're wrong in the right sort of way. Let me tell you what I mean. Um, justification for our position uh, sometimes is, goes something like, well, it's the way I was raised, or, or I'm old fashioned. Um, and that may be true, but that sort of makes it sound like the way we should make church decisions is based on our likes or our history. Likewise, another wrong way to go about this would be to say, if we say, well, just fall in line, or, or we try to intimidate others, well, then we're communicating that might makes right. Um, but the church shouldn't, should certainly not be deciding things based on preference or on power. No, our, our policies, we aim to make our policies based on Christ and the scriptures. And, and you know, we talk a lot about following Christ. And following Christ includes going where he leads us. So that means uh, my opinion isn't the most important. What Christ calls me to do is... Uh, or put another way, how can I follow or submit to Christ? And the foundation and the starting point for all, for any and every question about church leadership is simple. Jesus is Lord. The goal for every Christian, regardless, even regardless of where we might fall on this issue, um, is to speak and act in ways that point to Jesus as our Lord. As our Lord... Um, we don't just cheer for him, or we don't just look at what he says or pay attention to what he says. We follow where he leads, and we listen to his instructions. And the reason that the LCMS doesn't have women pastors is because of this, because we're convinced that it's a way in which we can be faithful to, and point to Jesus, not, uh, there, there may be any number of reasons people give, but that's really the reason that, that we do, uh, that we've had this policy. And if that weren't true, I don't care what other reason we have, it wouldn't be a good policy. The reason we do it is because we are trying to be faithful in pointing to Jesus as Lord. And uh, the model of leadership that Christ gives us is about service, not rights. It's about taking up our cross and following him as we learn to, to love, to serve, and to die for self. I like Laura Lee's message about the, the fork and the spoon. And, and they both are they're different, but they're both helpful. Neither one's more important, but they both serve, albeit sometimes in slightly different ways. Um, and Christian leadership, uh, really what's far, again, it kind of to say the same thing a different way, Christian leadership is really all about Jesus. And, and everything else is way backseat to, to simply following Jesus. Um, and Christian leadership is supposed to be about, uh, not about a pastor or about us striving to do anything, but rather us uh, trying to be faithful to Jesus as, as faithful as we can be. So uh, let's get into the specifics What's Jesus' relationship and interactions with women? And I'll ask, this is maybe a tough ask, but it's something we, we try to do. Try to come, we'll try to come at this not from a 21st century, you know, with the 21st century biases, but think about what it would be like in Jesus' day for him to do the things that he did. And because in the context of the first century AD, Jesus has an astonishing assortment of interactions with women. He heals them. He speaks to them and listens to them, and he intercedes for a, a variety of women. Jesus also regularly speaks with, eats with, 
and teaches women, which is at the very least odd and probably more likely potentially scandalous for a rabbi to do these kinds of things. Jesus also condemns treating women as an object or property, and he champions for their religious involvement and connection to himself and to his father. Um, the big exception, which is, of course, what we're talking about, is, however, he does call only 12 men uh, to be his apostles. So uh, apostles now is what we're talking about. What are apostles? Well, the apostles were set apart from the other disciples and entrusted with preaching the message of the gospel and of the kingdom of God. Uh, the apostles officially spread the message after Jesus' ascension, because Jesus knew he wasn't going to be there, so he's got to, uh, to prepare some other folks to do so. And the apostles were simply the ones who Jesus authorized to speak and teach officially on his behalf. Um, never once does Jesus make any sort of a sermon about men being more important than women or anything even close to that. Um, the apostles were called to preach. They were called in part also so... so so people could clearly know when there was a disagreement, all right, what's the real message? Because this is going to happen in the, in, the, in the New Testament. We read about this problem. Okay, so some people are saying this about Jesus, and others are saying this. Well, who do we listen to? Well, Jesus appointed the apostles, and he taught them, and they spent time with him. They're the ones to listen to. Uh, later, after, you know, that's all the Gospels, that's Jesus. But later in Acts, Paul is also called to be the extra apostle, the apostle to the Gentiles. And then there's the case of folks like Matthias uh, or James, the brother of Jesus. And we see, we talked briefly about this last week, the church in Jerusalem appointing seven men as deacons. And Paul also looks to pass on the baton of preaching and publicly leading the church onto men like Timothy and Titus. The point is, these public preachers and official leaders of the congregation were, were men. Um, now that's, you know, we, we also want to be fair and look at the other side of the coin too. On the other hand, we do continue to see women playing important roles and leading the church in, in some capacities. They, they definitely do, in some cases, share the gospel. They teach and uh, and they just were not appointed as the official leader over a congregation, even though they sometimes do lead, at least in some senses of the word. Um, often men, or I mean, not men, often women, such as folks like Aquila or Mark's mother or Lydia, in fact, are the hosted congregations in their own houses. Paul often refers to both women and men as co-workers in Christ, working together for the gospel together. And of course, we've got the great example of the women at the tomb who were the first to see the resurrected Christ. And we read in our gospel lesson, Luke chapter 10, when Jesus corrects Martha, he doesn't tell her that she should be barefooted in the kitchen. He says the exact opposite. He says, where's a woman's place? Simple, beside her Savior, listening to him. In, in Jewish and, and both Jewish and Roman culture, these kinds of things were scandalous. Women were not, were not considered citizens at all, and yet Paul will say things like, we're all one in Christ, citizens of God's kingdom. Yet again, the, the one exception is we never see the church officially selecting a woman to be the primary teacher or pastor. So we don't see that example, and basically the LCS position is we try to follow the example that we see as best we can. Uh, again, there's, there's a lot of variety, and there's a lot of women who are leading in a variety of different roles, but we never see them officially leading uh, a church um, or preaching uh, as the official uh, uh, preacher. Again, now, however, the church's history, we've got to admit, is far from perfect. The church as a whole, and certainly individual Christians and, and, uh, and men, have not always respected women as co-workers in Christ and fellow heirs of salvation. And the way in which the church has used this, you know, our, some of our positions has been as a bludgeon or as a tool uh, to do the wrong sorts of things. And, and if we are willing to learn 
from history or listen to the women in our own lives think we'll see a need for both individual and collective repentance. Uh, at times, we need to be strongly reminded that the church is not here to hold up patriarchy, but to hold up Christ, who came to give his life as a ransom for many. Uh, we don't, we don't uh, ascribe to a certain uh, position other than the position that the New Testament teaches us. And, and it's also pivotal to remember that all Christians, all Christians, all of us, are to submit to Christ and to submit to others. It's not unique uh, that, that women are to submit. It's that all of us are to submit. For instance, we are told to submit to authorities. <laughs> not that submitting is easy for any of us. It's not that our leaders are always faithful because they're not. However, you know, think about it. Paul, Paul doesn't really care about everything else. He cares about the gospel. He cares about Jesus, and he cares about the kingdom of God being advanced. Uh, he doesn't care much about anything else. Uh, and practically everyone, right, appreciates a faithful spouse. Everyone appreciates a faithful worker or a faithful friend or a faithful child. And, and it's important to remember that submitting does not mean, never does it mean doing anything someone else says. That's not what submitting means in the Gospels or in the New Testament. But what it does mean is it means to choose to be faithful, supportive, and loyal. And when people receive loyalty, especially when they maybe know that they don't really deserve that loyalty or that support, it can open hearts and minds to hear the gospel, which is what Paul cares about. All of our life is an opportunity to glorify God and witness to his greater plan and purpose than the plans of the world. I might say it another way, is that there may be good policies, there may be things that we want to strive and reach for, but the thing that we want most to strive and reach for is the complete fulfillment and the restoration of all things. We're not piecemeal trying to fix things, and that's what the church is primarily focused on, is the eternal solution, the big picture solution that can only be found in community in Christ. Um, in Titus chapter 2, which is our, our reading, our second reading, Paul challenges everybody, and that's, I think that's important to remember. Every, any single group, really just focus on the group that you're in. Don't focus on everybody else's group. Focus on the group that you're in, and you'll see that what Paul says is challenging. Uh, Paul challenges young and old, male and female alike, to live holy and decent lives. Why? What's the point? Why bother with this? So that we can be a witness to the world. Older men, for instance, are not given a free pass to be grumpy or say whatever they want. Instead, they're told to be sober-minded, self-controlled, sound in faith, love, and doctrine. Older women are not to act like the real housewives of Orange County, uh, but to help out the next generation. Younger women are to be loyal and supportive wives. Young men are not given a pass to sow their wild oats or take whatever they can. Rather, they too are told to be self-controlled, to be a model of good works and of sound speech. Um, it's important to remember, Paul. when Paul is writing this letter, he's talking to people, and ink is, it's just a lot harder to write. So he can't, he can't cover absolutely every situation in life. Uh, but Paul's going to talk about the situation that the vast majority of people in his time are in, which is why he doesn't really talk about singles, because the vast majority of people in life are, are uh, married. It's just a little different than today's society. And I also think it's really important for us to remember Paul's instructions, I really don't think, they're not intended, they're, their primary goal is certainly not to strictly define the roles of everyone. That's not his point. Paul's attitude is rather this. This is what he's trying to communicate in all this. Wherever you are at in life, do an excellent job of it. Your life and your loyalty are a witness to your Savior. Now, Paul, again, you, we look at the rest of the New Testament, we look at the New Testament church and what Paul says, I think it's very clear. Paul is not advocating for authoritarianism or male chauvinism or any other system. It's, it's the exact opposite, really. Paul wants all men and women, people of every tribe, nation, and language to be saved. And 
and to kind of throw the challenge out there, the world sometimes may value some things more or less than others. And the world may sometimes view um, uh, the, the role, uh, the different roles of different people as less valuable, or maybe mothers are viewed as less valuable, or blue collar workers are viewed as less important in the grand scheme of life. But Paul's take is that every individual, it doesn't matter, every individual can be a witness and simply by being faithful and loyal in any job or any responsibility or, to use a Lutheran vocab, in any vocation. No, Paul clearly doesn't want to prop up Roman patriarchy or, uh, in, in Roman or Jewish society. What he wants is people to gather around the crucified and risen king. And he encourages all, not just one group, but all groups to adopt the same servant attitude that Jesus lived out. And since it's not, it's not about power or money or position, then you and I can be a good witness by being a faithful parent, sibling, child, friend, worker, or neighbor. By simply, it doesn't matter, you don't have to, you don't have to go anywhere else than where you already are to be a good witness to have an important role uh, in this world. You simply be faithful, loyal, and supportive, whatever position you find yourself in. Not necessarily just because that's who you are or because the people around you always uh, merit that, but because it's a testimony uh, to your Savior and to His unearned grace that He gave to us. And we, in a small way, reflect that in the relationships and, and realities around us. Um, if uh, you are convinced that the scriptures instruct that, that women are, are not to be spiritual leaders of a whole congregation, um, and I admit, I understand probably not everybody necessarily sees that way, but if you do, then this can be, this too can be a way to witness. An opportunity to be obedient to Christ, not culture. Uh, because Whatever our position, we certainly, I think, as Christians, all of us want to be faithful to Christ and to God's word. And to sum up kind of the position again, women are in uh, pivotal and varied roles uh, throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, and so throughout our congregation, but, but not as spiritual leaders of the whole congregation. But really, again, it's really much, much more important uh, it's really all about following Christ. It's not about pastors ever. It's not ever supposed to be about pastors anyway. It's really about following Christ. And uh, additionally, again, uh, this is not just uh, about our position. It's really about all of our opportunities, our roles in life, and our attitudes, and, and, and our witness. Because we all, every single one of us, ought to be actively seeking to support one another. Um, and actively seeking to be loyal, faithful, supportive uh, in, in whatever roles and relationships and, and occupations or vocations we found, find ourselves in. And certainly, those in Christian and any Christian leadership position, including pastors who might have to be held accountable, ought to be doubly concerned with serving, not with privilege or power. Because Jesus really, it's all about Jesus, and Jesus gives us far and away the best definition of leading when he has to interrupt the apostles who, uh, well, one of the times he has to interrupt the apostles about who are fighting over who's going to get the best position. And Jesus says, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. After all, the, the goal of the church is not for us to attain leadership positions, but for all of us to lead others to Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.